Welcome back to the Film Alchemist Podcast, the show where we look at movies we love, break them apart, to find out what gives them their magic. I'm your host, Josh Griffey, joined as always by my former platoon mate, turned mindless killer and co-host, Alex Dandino. That's right, guys. This month, the pod is held captive. Uh, as always, if you uh, appreciate listening to the show, and we hope you do, we appreciate having you, please take a second and leave us a rating and review, especially if you're listening on Apple Podcast app. That helps us a ton. Please share the show with your friends on all your socials. You can find us there, too. Uh, we use Twitter a lot, at FilmAlchemist1. Uh, yeah, we want to hear from you guys. What kind of movies you want us to cover, themes, double features, guest hosts, anything, guys. Let us know. You can email the show, filmalchemistpod at gmail.com. And you can uh, see the faces that emit these golden voices, right? These golden toned voices on our YouTube channel, Nerd Alchemist. Ooh. That's plural with an S at the end. All right, guys. Uh, again, stating this is the pod is held, ha- held captive. Held captive. Killed Haptive, yes. I'm five. I'm one minute in, and words don't work. Da, 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 da. This is gonna be a banger. Slap, slap. That's what the kids say. I heard. All right, the pod is held captive. That's why I've been oxygen deprived. My ties are too tight. Uh, today, Alex brought us a movie that he said is this even a captive movie? I would argue this is the most captivity of any of the movies we've watched. Uh. Alex actually chose The Manchurian Candidate. I believe it's 1962, the Frank Sinatra version we're doing today. Uh, I love when this happens. This is one of those movies that everyone always talks about and references and has always told me it's great. But for some reason, this was one of my blind spots. I had never seen The Manchurian Candidate before last night. Uh, And spoiler alert, it fucking rips. This movie is awesome. So, Alex... What brought this movie to mind? Why do you love it so much? Why were you excited to talk about it this week? Um, well, I mean, probably the thing that brings it to mind is obviously the um, origin point for the, like, the plot of the movie itself. Mm-hmm. They begin as captives, and then uh, Lawrence Harvey becomes the most captive when you think about it. But really, we all are captive during the Manchurian Candidate. Um, I saw this movie in high school, like just randomly on TV. My dad... We were watching, like, uh, I think maybe TCM or something like that. And he goes, oh, man, Training Canada. I'm like, the hell's that? And he's like, Frank Sinatra's in it. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, you know, at that point, you're like, sure, whatever. It's Italian Frank teenager famous, duty. It. <laughs> yeah. But we watched it, and then I watched it again, and then I went and bought the DVD. And I just sort of, like, fell in love with this movie because – and then you realize, too – this movie is kind of a blueprint for a lot of spy thrillers. Like, and everything taut and awesome about this movie has, they've attempted to recapture this awesomeness every time they make a political thriller or something like that. And nothing is quite as engaging. Even if the, even the remake with Denzel is not quite as engaging as this movie itself. Yes. And I think, I think that's like, that's the real magic of this movie in general is that everything about it is engaging and it has a lot of the sixties things that we talk about sometimes, you know, movies like movies of the era when people weren't all like when the internet did not exist, people did not have to know everything. You couldn't just immediately (laughs) pop on your phone and look up, you know, Oh, brainwashing and psychotropic stuff, like stuff like that. Like it's so the same way we talked about how psycho ends with like an explanation of what that is of like what his psychosis is. This movie has that same sort of 60s issue of like having to explain things, but it still does it so well and so entertainingly. And again, it's just such a fascinating and intriguing movie, particularly the way it's shot. I, I think once we get into it, the um, the actual like brainwashing scenes in Manchuria might be some of the more interesting, might be some of the most interesting stuff that was shot in the 60s, I think. Yeah, I think that that is one of the the real achievements of the movie is how much time they spend with characters just telling us shit right whether it's the the yeah. manchurian doctor uh the him and the russian guy just arguing about the actual plot of what they're trying to do and why they need to do <laughs> right, these things right. frank sinatra is constantly just telling us what he thinks is happening um even in the climactic scene right where he's breaking it down with the queens he knows what's up 
we know what's up because he has the deck, but we're still going to walk through every single fucking thing that we've already heard 10 other people tell us out loud is happening, right? So this is a movie right. that, I mean, if Ellen Page's character in Inception somehow became an entire movie of just explaining things, that's the Manchurian Candidate. <laughs> but you're right. It is so beautifully shot, and the acting is fucking amazing. I actually was surprised because I've never thought of Frank Sinatra as a great actor. Like, I've seen him in stuff, and you're like, all right. No. He is phenomenal sure. in this movie. And I think that's the, that's the trick of the movie is – how well they pull off having to explain these. Because it's the thing. For a, a spy espionage thriller, right? Not even know a political thriller. Whatever genre you would lump this in with, right? There it's is like not three different a lot genres of intrigue. Wrapped into we one. pretty much know every fucking thing that happens real fucking fast through exposition. But yet it is always yeah. thrilling. And I'm always just yeah. fascinated. It's almost the the exposition becomes hypnotic to the audience. Yeah, I it's, think that's really the thing cool. that's most impressive about this movie is the exposition itself is so engaging. Mm -hmm. Like that scene with Sinatra and Lawrence Harvey when they're going through like it's the it's the pivotal moment where Sinatra finally like gets the four one one on what's what's actually going on. That should be the most boring scene in the history of movies. Yeah. Like he's literally going down the list of things <laughs> all of us already know. Yeah. And yet, he's like, I am so he's like, locked I in killed, and engaged. I I'm killed like, my, oh my boss. God. Yeah, we watched that 30 minutes ago. Then I killed again. <laughs> yeah, we also watched that. All right. Yeah, like, we, we know. know. <laughs> Sinatra came in and told his and yet, new way too fast fiance <laughs> that he already knew you did it. <laughs> but it is. You can't. I, I love engaging. that scene. But this that scene's a great example of what this movie does well. Let's try to dramatize things that you already know have happened through exposition, but they yeah. do these really brilliant tricks. Like that, the ticking clock of the solitaire game is fucking fascinating. Even though you're like, why is, are the Queens exponentially powerful? Like, I don't know. Frank Sinatra's like, look, it's me between the Queens. I am your ruler now, right. but you're like, yeah, I love this. But in that shot, we have this extreme close up, very harsh, hard focus on Shaw. Right. But then when we cut to Sinatra, mm -hmm. it's this really weird, soft focus as if he barely exists in oh. the reality of the room. And that kind of you stuff wanna know, keeps it so engaging. You want to know something really fascinating about that? That is actually, and this is, again, this goes to the credit of our show, Film Alchemy, man. That is a mistake. The, really? Um, Sinatra. Because when they Sinatra cut to the side view of both of them, he's in good focus again. So it, Sinatra admittedly was a one take guy. Like he, his his first takes were always very good. So they tried to use as many first takes of him as they could because the second time he just couldn't really get the same gusto. So the one take they had of the dead on shot of Sinatra, he kept shifting focus, and so it was coming in and out of focus. Frankenheimer, John Frankenheimer, the director, is like, I'm keeping that in. So he left it in, and now film historians actually praise him for using that shot as Raymond's sort of shifting focus and inability to actually concentrate. Like his brain is fuzzy from all the programming. And it's amazing because that originally was the worst shot of like four takes and they had to use it because it was the most compelling. So <laughs> that's what it was, but, it, but that's it's like beautiful that's accident, what it is. right? It's perfect. Absolutely. Because again, yeah, we're looking through the eyes of this, this man who's, you know, God, I think, that is the other thing this movie does well, right? I, that The fact that that was not intentional blows my mind because it's such an obvious choice, right? Like, if you see oh, yeah, that totally. movie now, yep. you're like, of course he's soft-focused. We get it. You know, like, it just feels <laughs> right. like, of course they would make... That's crazy that that's an accident. I think one of the things that's that really nuts. was brilliant about this movie to me, I love the way... We see almost no honest interactions the entire movie. Right. That what I love about this movie is that, in a way, we're focusing on this one kind of aspect, right? This trained hitman, right? And that he can be compelled to commit murders against his, uh, you know, inner morals, right? Despite, like, this theory in hypnosis, right? He's like, I found the loophole, and we can do that. But what you start right. to notice in the movie, right? That's kind of our central focus, what you realize throughout the movie is how much hypnosis is happening to every single character. And I think that is interesting. 
I think that elevates this movie a little bit for me above the classic, you know, oh, Russia, you know, is bad. <laughs> bad guys, bad guys. Right. It's because you start seeing how it feels like everyone's getting worked in every scene, right? Everyone is trying yeah. to get something from someone or some greater ideal, right? Like the way Sinatra, when they're like, you're freaking the fuck out, dude. You need a vacation. He's like, I refuse. You're like, he's so ingrained into the mission of the military and this and that, right? He's kind of hypnotized. Like the scene that really was right. stunning is when they're in crowded Madison Square Garden and he's looking for this killer. He knows he's about to kill. But when the national anthem comes on, him and his buddies stop and salute. And I was like, that's their fucking program. Everyone has programming yeah. throughout, right? And oh, the, yeah. the thing about Shaw that's so sad is that what we see really early is that his entire life is he's been programmed always. You yeah. know? I, There's never been a time. And yeah. again, this is like the best. This is the most enga- engaging part about the movie is that like – I mean, if, if for 62, like it's in the middle of the Cold War. So the big deal is communism. So communism is like at like out of context. Now that movie seems so dated. But you realize, actually, when you think about it in the context of our era now, it crystallizes even more. Really, everyone's programming is like Johnny Island, who is Raymond Shaw's stepfather, is this big like brash republican kind of a trumpy guy like who you know, he's a claims the left is movie, wrong actually. and all this like <laughs> is he really yeah i believe i that's always thought Democratic he was a republican it's so weird <laughs> you forget there was a time when they were kind of switched around yeah i know and like well that's because they were actually like doing their thing I, I, it's fascinating to me yeah like but he's like this big fucking gusty blowhard type dude yeah. and that's but he also is Get in front of the cameras, get in the press. Like, that's the programming of us. Like, we're all watching that guy now. Mm-hmm. Like, that's like the important thing about this movie itself is that, like, you're right. Everyone has their own sort of program. And yeah, like, the tragedy of Raymond Shaw is that he literally never had a chance. His mother is a fucking psychotic person who is like secretly a Soviet agent and all this other crazy shit. But ultimately, the, the, the true genius of this movie is that absolutely no one is safe. No one is safe because we all have the things in our brain that make us stand up and salute. Like yeah, there's well, no, also the there's movie no never draws kind of a, a clear line of this is right and wrong. Right. What the movie kind of no. seems to say in general is, you know, and I think that's what I mean. You can call it communism back then was the boogeyman. Now we just yeah. change the words like crazy, right? Whether it's socialist or, Q or right. whatever the fucking things are, you know, on the internet. If you go on Twitter, right. it's just all Manchurian brainwashed candidates, right? Like, now Absolutely. people are saying 5G towers are spreading. to Like, we have that, but it's everywhere, right? It might not be a political ideology, right? Like this grand government down theory, but we, right. we might be more fuzzy than we've ever been, right? And I think what totally. this movie says more than anything... And then, well, I don't know. Cause, all right, so let me make the point and then let me count, contradict myself in Devil's Advocate, right? Which is, I think the movie <laughs> sure. makes the point that anything that is getting you to act just, just to carry out orders in general, right? The whores of just mindlessly following orders, period, is bad, right? right? But then the only person we see who seemingly is following no orders is Angela Lansbury, and she's really fucking bad. <laughs> so I don't know. The movie kind of has a contradiction built in, right? Because it well, it a little I, bit plays at the horrors of war, right? Just, you know, here sure. are these guys having fun, and then, you know, Shaw comes in, no fucking fun, get out of the brothel and bar, let's go. They immediately get busted right. and betrayed, and so it's this, these whores, these small whores of carrying out orders, right? And then we see in the greater world, right? Like Sinatra's just doing his, like, oh, I'll just BPR. It's like, well... You messed up, so now you have to quit. I don't want to quit. Nope, fuck you. You know, like, there's this machine that's just chewing up everyone in the movie, it feels like. Yeah. Well, I mean, no, I mean, I, I think you make a good point, though. I, I think that the movie is trying to, I think what the movie is trying to say is to read between the lines. Like, don't, don't listen to the Red Queen. Like, read between the lines. And obviously, like, the Red Queen is a red hair. Like, there's 
symbol there's symbolism within the movie of who the red queen is and what the red queen is but like the overall to me the overall theme of the movie itself is to not to pay attention for yourself like right. don't be brainwashed by all these other people and all these other things like try to be a raymond shaw because that's the other thing too is like raymond shaw is brainwashed he is the manchurian candidate and at the very last minute he's able to undo that programming because he is finally able to see for himself who the true Red Queen is. Like that, I think, is probably right. the more engaging thing about the movie yeah. is thinking for yourself is dangerous, but it also is the right the that's the right thing to do. It's not yeah. a political stance, but it's not one line or the other. It's thinking the, for yourself. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that too, right? But even in his final act, right? So in his final act, Shaw takes out the Manchurian choice of candidate which is Iceland, right they are going to help right. this guy who's a fucking terrible useless man ascend to the presidency right he's the manchurian candidate so their sleeper agent ends up ruining that plan but even in that act right that was just sinatra pulling the strings now right not saying do that but cutting him free without taking any precautions that yeah this guy's pretty fucking unstable right well, like there's i don't a, there's know a like, see, that maybe sinatra wants him to fester back out that's sort of the thing i don't know because see that's always the thing about the movie that's fascinating to me is like there's that interpretation but then the other thing too is like because i think about the scene where he is gonna like where he puts himself in is like it's broken all the strings raymond can't be controlled anymore Raymond literally gets a phone call and goes and does what he's told to do. So, like, the question really is, through the ending of the movie, is is did that actually work? Did Marco actually break the entirety of the program? Yeah. Or was Raymond still under his own control? Did Raymond decide to I, actually do this himself? I think that is classic movie cheating, right? The end of this movie, right? Sure. Because I think it's one of those now audiences today – are going to be more trained to be like, oh, we know that there's going to be like a surprise ending, right? And so I right. think maybe back then you would get a bigger surprise out of this kind of trickery, you know, because it makes, because Sinatra sitting there like, it fucking failed, I'm the dumbest guy ever. And I'm like, yes, I've been watching the movie. You're horrible at your job. <laughs> the entire operation essentially is go get drunk with an assassin and don't arrest him and don't like bring a tape recorder. Which is madness. His whole the whole theory of that unit is so dumb, but ne that's neither here nor there. I right? love it. What I think happened, and this is the crazy part. I mean, what you're saying is true. Could there be any programming? Because Sinatra says your programming is all gone, but I order it. Right. So maybe in a way it is the roots of it are still there. But I think when Shaw goes up into that perch. I think he right. is free, and I think it's just movie cheating that he's setting his sights on the target, knowing that he's going to kill the other two. Like, they couldn't right. see that. He didn't need to trick them. I think that's just movie cheating to make it more thrilling. Yeah, and that's, again, like, that's the one I give. That's, like, no, I can fine. deal with that kind of cheat. bother me, but I don't I don't. It think doesn't ruin the movie. As, no, no, fuck no, it's a great movie. But as an audience member, I never bought in for a second that, Oh, he's still programmed and he's still going to kill that guy. Right? And when he right. when he changes his targets, you're like, "Oh, of course." Because they right. took because this is the thing about Shaw's character is it's this entire journey where he said, first I was programmed to be this horrible piece of shit by my mom." And for one brief minute, one brief minute something came in and it scrambled all the fucking signals, you know, in this snake bite moment, meet cute, right? <laughs> Severs mm -hmm. him from this, you know, kind of previous hypnosis he had from his mother, right? That everyone's a commie and right. we're rich and better than everyone. And fu this Game of Thrones life he was leading over there on the other side of the lake. And now he's just like, right, I got right. a girlfriend and her dad's actually nice to me. And, you know, I dig it. So for like a brief, small fucking moment, uh, it's all good, you know? And so... When he comes out of it and realizes what has happened, because this is the other question they don't quite answer, is Raymond always acts like he doesn't know what happened, right, when he's yeah. awake. But the rest of this platoon right. we've seen are having dreams, so 
you would have to imagine he's having those dreams too. So a part of him on that last day, he probably has the image of his wife being shot. Oh, yeah. So, well, I mean, I think that's the thing. I think his dreams are different because like all of Marco Marco's and the platoon guy, like the um, other guy, um, their dreams are very specific of the actual like brainwashing sessions. Like it's this big theater in the round. And oh, my God. It's again, it's uh, it's. It's among my favorite, like probably t- it's my top five scenes in a movie ever. Because first off, like they so well, I don't know about you. Cause this is my first viewing, but I was so fucking confused. <laughs> like I was, yeah, no, that's the best part. I remember because it's just playing through, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, wait, where the f- where the fuck are we? Because yeah. we go from it's, oh, it's- we've escaped. Uh, you know, here's a medal of honor. I'm great. It's everything's cool. And then all of a sudden, you just see right, Sinatra right. and the boys at a women's gardening club, like a women's garden party. Yeah, and I was, yeah. What the what the fuck is happening? That's like the that's the really fascinating part about this movie. And I remember I remember reading about that kind of thing too, like the way that Frankenheimer had to shoot it. Oh my god! Is, yeah. In a lot of regards too, like he was like literally. I think I can't remember. I I don't want to say that it was the scene. Like the shots were like. Um, like the sets were side by side, but I do know there was like a, like moments where like he would have to like whip like pan the camera around, and literally like people would be running to the next set to like <laughs> sit in place where they were in the previous. I feel like that was something I read, but it's one of these masterful scenes because part of the programming in this guy, the guy who's like he's a real like <laughs> look, it's the sixties. He's a very Fu Manchu mustache. Like he's just <laughs> he's a. The Dr. Manchuria, whatever you want to call him. I don't even remember what he's called. But nevertheless, like he is talking about program programming the mind to see other things, to see what they're doing. And they're in this like theater, like big like theater in the round. It's almost like Disney concert hall. And then they cut to the soldiers who are on stage sitting there and they're actually they're actually seeing it as, yeah, like a women's garden party. Yeah. But then well, there's I love, all these it great feels little, like a continuous my, spin, right? Where it's you see the ladies right. in the audience, and it's just all these old ladies enjoying talks about hydrangeas or whatever. And when the camera right. pans back, and Sinatra my... is like the first soldier, right? He's the first soldier in the line. All of a sudden, behind him, mm-hmm. there's all these, you know, communist party propaganda posters and shit. And you're <laughs> yeah, like, there's like what? huge posters and shit. And they're all just still hanging out, like they're at this uh, old ladies gathering. And then it cuts back, and yeah, you've got yeah. this like kind of almost operating theater look with all these various communist party leaders. And that was, it's such a, a clever, just sledgehammer to the mind when that the happened. part that, the part that always, and when I was, and I saw when I was in high school, it still like sticks with me is, um, so basically in the scene there, within the context of the story, Raymond Shaw kills two of these guys in his unit. Um, he's awarded like the medal of honor and so right, and he's like, they say he saved him valiantly of all the tried to save him valiantly. But the scene is, um, basically is like, okay, well, everyone is asking like Raymond has to act out of his own. Like he won't, he won't kill out because that's out of his character. So I'm going to prove you guys wrong. And basically he's like, does anyone have a pistol? And it cuts no, no, no. to First the garden is the party towel, scene. though. The towel is crazy. Well, there's the towel. Ta- the towel's crazy. The gunshot though, because it's not it's not the gunshot though. It's the woman that it cuts to. She lit like she's literally dressed to the nines, garden party, and she pulls out her gun. She's like, "Here, you can use mine." And it's so off putting and such I, a weird like. I don't know toss. about you, but I would venture that's probably pretty standard happenings in a Georgia <laughs> gardening circle. Oh, you need a pistol? Honey? To be I fair, got mine. yes. <laughs> 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 yes, absolutely. 100% that's true. Less subversive than you think. I absolutely agree with that. <laughs> okay, so I'm reading about this. The brainwashing sequence was filmed three times in its entirety. The Garden Club ladies and Corporal, Al- Corporal Melvin's viewpoint and then uh, against three different sets constructed so the camera could turn completely around in each. The parts were then edited together to convey the shifting, pers- to convey shifting perspective. Awesome. So there were... Blended sets. But again, like this is like the this is the awesome part about this movie is 
to convey brainwashing, like that's the fun part about what it is, is like, it's not just a ba- it's it's not just a back and forth that it's not just one thing seems weird. It's all these little pieces yeah. seem out of place. Like there's a Soviet guy at a Georgia garden party, or there's a bunch of, you know, ladies with weird hats sitting in this theater in the round watching a guy strangle another guy. It's, it's unsettling. And yeah. I think that's the most engaging part about the movie is because it's unsettling. It sticks with you through the entirety of the film. Well, it's, it's a, it's a brilliant, set up for this kind of a movie right because this is a thriller right that has a huge problem which is this is the thriller of i'm standing on the train tracks completely free and able to move and walk off the train tracks and the train is like five miles down the tracks and i'm just watching it come at me the whole way and i'm like that's a train that's a train these are train tracks that's a train i'm on a train track and i have a long time to sit and know exactly what's coming and so, for a thriller, there's very few moments of shock and awe and, oh, look at what we figured out. Because they never let us figure things out. They just tell us the whole time. But what this scene does is it, right. it puts us, that slowly panning camera is us in the whole movie. We are just floating yeah, helplessly, totally. unable to get our feet on the ground. When when Shaw is told to go strangle his least favorite guy, right? And he wraps yep. it around. And he starts choking him, and they just tell the guy, hey, don't fight, work with him. To fucking get murdered, and he does it. It's awesome. And it's slow and steady and so matter-of-fact, and then the guy, the scientist just picks up expositoring again, (laughs) right? Exposing, whatever the word would be, right? He's like, ah, back to my Pavlovian Institute, you know, PowerPoint. (laughs) And he just goes right back to work. And then Shaw goes right back to his chair. He even is like, excuse me, and ask people to move their chairs and shit. It's so, but that's it. That's what makes it thrilling and scary. It's like you're watching it happen in slow motion, but you can't alter course. Yeah. And that really helps set the mood for the brainwashing, right? And the, the next kill is what adds the little extra dynamicness to it, which is he has to kill the innocent, possibly too young to be in the unit guys. So you're like, here's already a guy that America yeah. abused and should not have put in this spot. And they were willing to kill him anyways, but now they're heartless for asking him to get killed. And he just smiles, right? He's the mascot. He's the platoon mascot. But as Raymond holds the gun, I don't know if you thought this, but I thought I saw like a slight shaking in the gun. Like on some very small oh, yeah, level, totally. Shaw was like, fuck, 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 fuck. In those two scenes mixed I... together, right? The slowly, I can't help it, strangulation, and the victim will let me do it, showing you how powerful this brainwashing yeah. is. Because that's the thing, a soldier killing, you're like, all right, that's not probably like as crazy. He already is a dick and everyone hates him anyways. But the guy letting right. himself be killed, that's crazy. But when he shoots right. the guy, I mean, that I little think shaking that's... of the gun, you can see that. So you have to imagine where is Shaw in his mind watching this, right? Is he truly right. the passenger who's watching or is he like hidden in his, you know, uh, cabinet room like in Dreamcatcher? <laughs> You didn't oh, think you'd no, get a I dream he, catcher yeah, I mean, reference th- in this pod, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah, I think it's very much like he's taking his own back seat. But then, so, but it's interesting though, is like all of this brainwashing stuff comes like in the middle of the movie after like Lieutenant Melvin has these dreams of like him at a garden party and wakes up. And the other thing too that I love is um, they have all these little like artifacts of brainwashing, like, Everyone says the exact same thing when they're asked about Raymond Shaw. Right. Everyone says like Raymond is the kindest, warmest, most loyal person I've like. Which we know for says a that. fact and, is wrong. <laughs> which we know for a fact is wrong, yeah. and it's fascinating because everybody also knows it's wrong. Like <laughs> Sinatra has that great line. And he goes, "It's not that Raymond's hard to like; he's impossible to yeah. like." And yet, I can't help but think this yeah. all the time. Like that. That is like the best part. And like that's like the great struggle of Marco's characters trying to get rid of like shake this feeling that something's off. Right. And he's it's fascinating because he starts of a bitch, but he cannot not say that about him. Right. And he's trying really, really hard to shake the feeling that there's no reason for him to think that because he has only terrible memories of Raymond Shaw. And yet he believes that Raymond Shaw is the kindest, warmest person. It's impossible. Right. And we all know that because Raymond Shaw is a dick to everyone. Yeah. 
big time. Big time the like, worst guy that's ever everybody. been. Everybody. <laughs> he's a real little shitbag. Granted, you're like, he's his mom the guy and that the you drunk, would shoot in the platoon. Uh, yeah, the drunk stepdad. They're both really bad. So, like, all right, he, you had one <laughs> leg, uh, you know, one leg behind your back in the ass kicking contest of life. The pro. Right. I mean, he he's a stone cold son of a bitch for sure. But what I think is really yeah. good about Marco is Marco kind of plays as this ultimate soldier, right? And they do the thing mm-hmm. where they try to they try to humanize him, right, and show that he's a little more inquisitive. That's why he's tracking it because yeah. he just gets random books sent to him all the time, right? And he's read them all right. about everything, right? So he's really smart. But the the brainwashing from the the American soldiers is a really fun field to plow, right? It's very fertile with kind of these symbolisms because all soldiers on some level are brainwashed. You must right. that the entire theory of military tactics and this and that, you know, not that like I'm a fucking expert or whatever, but you know, I played Halo and shit, so I know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Granted in that I'm a one man army. No, just kidding. But, but you have to Follow commands and orders and trust that the people above you are giving you the proper orders and this and that. And so watching a soldier grapple with this, you know, something, my mind is telling me something and I don't like it. I can't accept it. That's really interesting from a soldier perspective. Yeah. I mean, that's, and I mean, that's like the best I think that's the best part about this is you real like that's the other part is you realize these men are soldiers, they're used to following or- orders, and not only that, they're now lauded as heroes. Like these are men who came back from war, uh nearly you know, nearly killed and they came back from war and they're unscathed. They're generally uh I mean, other than like waking up screaming, they're generally pretty ha- they're generally pretty well adjusted <laughs> guys, I guess. But like that's the crazy thing is you think about going to war and being in a platoon with these men, like you don't consider any of thing you don't consider thing any anything amiss because you can't. You have to trust the guy next to you. And I think that's what makes the concept of Raymond Shaw so complicated and so fascinating because like when we begin the movie, everybody fucking hates Raymond Shaw. Mm-hmm. It's stated very clearly at the very first in like the first five minutes of the movie how much these guys dislike Raymond Shaw. <laughs> Yeah, yet, well, he's the he's guy like who the, walks in the, and he's like, hey, you guys are having fun in this most imagine, unimaginably horrible situation. Stop it. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's a total douche. He's mean, to, he's mean to everyone. And it's fascinating because, and then, yeah, like, everybody who, talk, who speaks to him speaks of him with reverence, and everyone knows it's wrong. Even he that, knows I think, it's is wrong. Like, he knows, he knows it too. Like everybody knows, <laughs> everybody knows something is wrong. And that is like the real, because we should be like, we all know it's wrong. We all know something's wrong too. But that is like the thing that I love about this movie is everybody is acting so hard to pretend like it's okay. And it's just not. And finally, when like, I guess really one of the big turning points is the scene in Central Park, like the scene that happens in Central Park. It's a misfire of the um, mechanism. Right. So basically, Raymond Shaw, anytime, anytime Raymond Shaw is going to be programmed to do something, the phrase is, "Why don't you sit down and play some solitaire?" So he's in a bar with Marco talking. Someone says that phrase, which is a very, very specific phrase to say. And again, that's one of those things you're like, well. Terrible choice on the people from Manchuria and it's, the general it's hard like, bad for guys modern in this audiences because you're like, I would never even be a soldier and fight for a country whose number one pastime is solitaire. Like, right? If this many people are right. playing solitaire, our country's not worth saving. <laughs> right. But that's like so they're in the bar. This triggers the programming and he starts doing the um, he all that's interesting is all he's doing is the actual like motions. He's not actually, he doesn't have a deck of cards with him. He's just, oh, we know he asked for a deck of yeah, cards. Yeah, the bartender so. gives him he a deck. He asked for a deck of cards. So once he sees the red queen, that's like the time. So when he gets the red queen, he stops because the, once the red queen's there, he has to be programmed to do something. And that's when the guy says, why don't you jump into the, why don't you jump into the pond in Central Park? And then Raymond walks and jumps into the pond in Central Park. Which apparently was the coldest day in 30 years in 1961 <laughs> whenever they shot this. So Lawrence Harvey was like, 
near frostbitten. But nevertheless, like totally worth that it. is sort of that. But that's like the best. That's like the thing about this movie is like the obedience to orders and the obedience to the thing that you know is not true. And that's like the real thing for Marco when he sees that he's like something is a miss. There's a misfire. Now I know that there's a misfire somewhere because Raymond Shaw is a hard person to talk to regardless. So now that I've seen him do something so uncharacteristic and so out of nowhere, because Raymond Shaw, the entire movie is very buttoned up, like so tense. Like even when uh, he's uh, p- when they put uh, put him on the plane with uh, Islin and his mom. Oh yeah, fucking. But maybe one of my all time favorite like douchebag moments is <laughs> Senator Islin goes behind the bar, puts on a little hat, and then turns on the twinkle lights. <laughs> And you're just like, oh my god, I'd kill him right there. I don't even need programming for that one. Yeah, he's like, such that's a piece just of the shit. <laughs> he's just an utter piece of shit in this movie. But that's the best part is like, so Raymond does that. So now Marco knows there's something amiss, and that's when Marco really starts to really excavate his own mind for the actual for the actual um, answer. And then what's crazy again, is that Henry Silva is a shows soldier up. Soldier watching another soldier just carry out orders from a superior, right? And because the and orders seem that's absurd, when... now it's like, well, this is crazy. And you're, but that's what I love is that. All of this is kind of there. There's a great sequence. I can't remember how they phrase it, right? But uh, the doctor, right? They're sitting in Raymond's room after he's had his accident, his car accident, right? Right, right. And he's just sitting there. He's like, "Do you know how valuable and destructive this weapon is that you have?" Like they're just talking about Raymond as he's this unbelievable force of you know possible yeah. destruction. Um, and that. Listening to them talk about, because normally in movies like this, when this is what they're talking about, right? It's a briefcase with VX nerve gas or a, a, a little nuke or something like that, right? They're talking yeah. about just one man who will unwaveringly follow an order. Just right. one fucking man who will act against his good nature, his good conscience, as it were. That guy is the most destructive right. force in this cold war, that is a really beautiful moment to me, man. I, I thought that was, well, I mean, it's, I thought that was really powerful. It's the scariest part. It's the most powerful part about the whole thing is that it's not a nuke or anything like that. That's going to take us out. It's one guy doing the wrong thing. Mm. And that I think is probably the most relevant thing that it's probably the reason the movie transcends time period or anything like that. It still works exactly the same today, right? How does everyone fight today, right? Something happens, which fucking feels like it's every 45 minutes in the news cycle now. People immediately go to Twitter. What are the jokes on my side and what are the jokes and memes on the other side? And we start lobbing those at each other. And no one ever listens. No one ever fucking learns. No one ever talks, right? That is exactly what this movie... What I love, too, is that, there again, every fucking thing feels like a work. Every scene. When Sinatra's on the train, and in a moment of just kindness, right, he meets this lady, and she comes up and lights a cigarette for him. She kept saying her number is Delta or Rio Delta something, and then, like, five digits, right? Right. She kept saying, I don't, because she gave him her hotel room, but then also this number, which I presume is her t- telephone number. I yeah. thought, I was like, oh, God, she's activating him. I was like, they're all fucking programmed. Uh, so this lady who then by the end of the movie becomes his wife and seems to really care for him uh, is loving yeah. in a way. You know, right? She does say, uh, yeah, I went and kissed my fiance and told him goodbyes because I met you on a train, like shaking like a fucking junkie. <laughs> and that's who I'm going to saddle my horse to. Uh, hey, fiance, it my junkie how- train boyfriend is in the clink. I'm going to go saddle my wagon to that, (laughs) right? But no, but that's why I was like, this is too crazy. Like, no woman would think this is, like, who you want to saddle down with, even though it's old not only that, like... But I thought when she was giving him the phone number, I thought she was activating him. (laughs) See, and that's, like... But But that's, that's like, the... That's the icon of the... That's iconography of the time. Like, that's what phone numbers used to be. But no, I'm saying because I assume everyone talking to everyone in this movie is is part of the game. Because I was like, why would she just, sure. like, maybe that's a thing that used to happen. But today, I was like, if I saw someone acting like that no, no. in public, I'd be like, peace, I'm out. 
<laughs> but it's but you know what's interesting is the first time I watched this movie, I thought the exact same thing because of two reasons. One, it's Janet yeah. Lee. And two, why would you make a why would you put a famous actress in 35 minutes into a movie to like fit like like it's just she's literally plopped into the middle of the film. Yeah, to then, then just like, sit in an apartment for Frank Sinatra to come home and tell her exactly what he's thinking and nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. That's it. Like it's so Frank Sinatra does so Frank Sinatra's phenomenal He's in this such movie. Such a great there's, actor in this movie. That was really like my biggest takeaway. There's one scene that he has and it's um it's the realization that definitely something is amiss for him. Like it's like the cold hard fact, which is he goes to uh Raymond's apartment and like Chunjin, who is his houseboy, it's played by Henry Silva is one of like the guys who was like helping program him. They have the most boring fight scene of all time. Oh yeah, dude. And I absolutely love that it. It's the, one of the I weirdest take kickboxing cardio <laughs> fight, right? Like all, all the, all the dudes in your neighborhood are like, yeah, I, you know, I kicked a heavy bag three times last year. I'll definitely whoop <laughs> some ass. It's, but that's the other thing. I mean, this movie has a couple of those like real head scratchers where it's, <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? Russia or China, whoever is responsible for that motherfucker, or Korea, I don't even remember which side he's on, right? He's a Judas. He's just being a traitor no matter what. I was like, are we to assume that they sent him and said, hey, here's this wildly important asset that we need to, you know, not draw attention to. Now let's put the most recognizable betrayer in his very house in not tell him to stop taking social calls. Like the fact that Frank Sinatra could just walk in and see the guy that could blow the whole operation was madness. Right. And then this other side, the other side of this coin is Frank Sinatra takes this man, a train killer in a hand to hand combat. Also like a karate. train killer, but not in like, but he like, does make you Frank wonder Sinatra how we ever karate. won wars. If that is how our <laughs> fighters were trained. Frank's not true. <laughs> it's, I mean, yeah. Uh, fucking yeah. Jackie Chan and eight for sure. Right? The, the, t- the technique is so bad. I mean, it's it's Frank Sinatra. Like Frank Sinatra, at one point, karate chops through a through like through a fucking table. I love how they like, act, you're just you like, know because that was one of the things where they're just on set. They're just like this fight sucks the balls. They're like these guys <laughs> suck at fighting, and then you know just some art department guy. They're like, hey, do you have something that Frank Sinatra could karate chop through with his brittle old bones? They're like, oh, yeah, we can rig that up. And they hit it, and they're like, oh, now I'm taking the fight seriously. Because <laughs> the manservant didn't snap like a table. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's like, also, yeah, it's like, oh, cool, that he kicked through go? the balsa wood table. The police just arrest him, it's- and they're like, he's a Korean, you know, double agent. And they're like, ah, nonsense. We dropped him off at the <laughs> pub down the block. Boys will be boys, am I right? <laughs> it's just... I mean, it's just perfect. That it's it's one of those like great moments. Beautiful. It it's one of those great moments because you're like, oh god, this is so just iconically '60s. It's just like, of course, this is the best fight scene we could come up with. It's just yeah. like, but it Frank would be Sinatra versus probably both, someone who could beat the hell yeah, out. If they of weren't him. both badass military people, right? But you're like, <laughs> there's a lot of us in like day to day life. That our fights would probably yeah. look a lot more like that than <laughs> movie fights. <laughs> there is one thing that we have not talked about yet that I have to touch on before we go, which is Angela Lansbury. Unbelievable. Who, Unbelievable. Oh, my God, man. The, her, First oh. off, she's young, which is weird Young-ish, for everybody. ish though? She, you know what's weird? She was I, only three years older than Lawrence Harvey. And she's supposed to be his mother. But that's what I mean. You you feel like she's one yeah. of those people that, like, in her high school yearbook, they're like, what'd you teach, homeroom? She's like, no, I, I graduated. <laughs> I, I graduated. But, like, because that's what I said. I'm like, God, she looks young, but then also still old. Old somehow. You know, but, man, she is. She yeah. was phenomenal. She's unbelievable. But I look, the whole character she- of this movie is, again, this is kind of one of those, 
also taking on the times is just she is such a horrible puppet master, right? A, a true snake, you know, yeah. amongst the flock. But no one sees her as a threat, right? She's just this woman, no. right? She can't possibly be doing anything. Right. It's un- no. There's a shot early in the movie that, oh, my God, it, it was just melting my brain. And it's when Sinatra's doing his first PR gig, right? And right. she's sitting there, and she kind of looks over and gives the, like, all right, you know, organ grinder monkey step drunken husband or whatever. Time to do your time to earn your fucking cheese crackers, you know, husband. <laughs> and she looks at him and he goes, I think the tifty pap communist, blah, blah, like he's all drunk and shit. And you're looking right. at him and she's just told him what to do, right? So that's taking the piss out of his kind of like authoritative. He's a senator, right? We're like, oh, he's a fucking stooge. He's, he's a stooge. He's a goon, right? Because we saw right. her give the order. But in the foreground, right, so there's Angela Lansbury, and just a little bit past her is a TV set that's showing this close-up of Senator Isley, Inslin, whatever his name is. I, I, Isley. Isley. Uh, decrying the communist, you know, invasion and defending America. So in the background, he looks like this fucking buffoon, you know, in a circus. Yeah. But on that TV, he looks fucking powerful and heroic. Exactly. And it, again, it's showing the the hypnotic nature of this kind of political theater that's happening in the movie. But that shot, I was just like, that is masterful. Unbelievable. I think that, yeah, that it really, any scene she has is so, well, I love too because because she slowly, you know, to take another, (laughs) you know, overused cliche, but the wolf in sheep's clothing, this movie is like, Mm -hmm. if the wolf is doing like a Jessica rabbit, where like every scene, it's yeah. like I'm going to show you a little more wolf. It is. Mm-hmm. It is really a, a wonderfully paced performance. Right. I well. I mean, like, and I know it's coming too. Like, that's the best part is I know it's coming, and then she says, "Why don't you uh, pass the time by playing some solitaire?" And every time I see this movie, every time I'm still like, "Fuck." She's the American oh, my operator. God. She's it, the it operator. Makes perfect she, sense because, because we've seen her do it. With, you know, yep. Senator Fuckboy, the whole movie. It's crazy. <laughs> yes. It's it's nuts. That one, that one got Angel- me. This movie has a couple moments that actually startled me, right? Because it does feel like one of those you kind of know what's coming all the time. Right. His own mother being the American. They kept saying it, and I just didn't think about it. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty right there on Front Street. Right. Like, it's a little too obvious. But, 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 but then-, then, again, we have this built-in, like, her own son, right? And she has that scene, and this is the most venomous scene she has, and she's brilliant in it, right? Because she plays it again with the Mrs. Potts voice, right? You start watching Beauty Mm -hmm. and the Beast now, and you're like, oh, maybe she fucking bitch slapped Chip. Maybe she broke her son on purpose. (laughs) Maybe maybe that's, maybe the Chip is hers. Oh, you don't see a commie in the fucking spoon drawer? Fucking bitch smatch Chip out of the, you know, the China cabinet. (laughs) Next time mommy says commie, you say... (laughs) Fire! <laughs> you know that? That's Mrs. Potts, right? But she's sitting there at the end, and she's going to get her way, right? And we know that Raymond's yeah. commands are severed, but he's just sitting there taking it in. And uh, she walks up to him, and she's just like, man, uh, you know, in this moment. Because that's the thing. Her husband dies, and we don't know exactly what happened, right? But somehow in this, now she has no one, you know, to puppet master for power. In this void, she yeah. finds this drunken fool right who does his job and she somehow has still has the juice to go reach out and say hey give me a trained assassin and i will steal this white house right and presume presumably use that to the betterment of the communist agenda whatever right right but they for some reason choose her son right like that's not something they pre-discussed and that's fucking ridiculous that you can imagine Angela Lansbury's character as we're shown in this movie not knowing who they're picking. You think they randomly targeted her son? There's no fucking no. way. Right? And yeah. why? In what better assassin, right? Who will she have the most control over? So she's so fucking full of shit, but she sits there and she's like, my own son, I can't. I asked for an assassin. I never thought it would be you. When this is over and we take power, 
I will turn around and use that power to destroy them. They'll pay for this. <laughs> so one, you're seeing her true face emerge, right? She's just out for this right. this wrath, right? She has that wonderful line where she's like, uh, our power will be ushered in with power that will make martial law look like chaos. And you're like, oh, my yeah. God. It's like some Emperor Palpatine shit, right? And she talks <laughs> about the speech that her and the you know the communists have been writing for years and talking about how the drunken buffoon is going to lift – the dead body of his, you know, candidate, and he's gonna give this speech, and how this drunken fucking dipshit is going to look like the ultimate hero enough where she can take everything, and she honestly is just lying right to this motherfucker's face that she did not it's... willingly sacrifice her son and this guy and probably her previous husband to get this unfettered power, man. But she delivers it's it with the most the true, terrifying. That, I don't know if that was true for you, but it felt like she was being earnest. But there is such a like a roiling subtext where you're just like, there's no way she I mean, let to a detail me it's, slip. No way. No, I think it's I think it's all for naught. Like to me, the most terrifying thing about uh, Angela Lansbury's performance is she does such a good job of being a bad mother. That by the end, I absolutely don't believe a fucking word yeah. she says. And that, I think, is the true power of the whole thing is she's a great but, operative. But take that take She's that such an incredible further, political right? operative. You don't believe what she says. I don't believe what she says. Why does she say it to a brainwashed son who, in theory, shouldn't remember it? Right. Why? Because Why is she telling that because, lie at that moment? Because I think that's the lie she tells herself. Like that's like because think about it. Like at the I end, like, like you, at the end, like that. Wouldn't you tell yourself like I'm a good parent. Like I'm doing this for the good of my country, but also for the good of my child. Sure. Like that's the lie she tells herself is like I would. Ne- I would never me. put my well, child. Well, because they do that. that with every character, right? Even the doctors, like when the Russians are like, our uh, hospital actually turned a problem. He's like, be careful. The disease of communism is very infect. They all think. The disease of capitalism yeah. is very... Famous. And he's like, they yes. all think they're doing well, and they think the Americans are definitely brainwashing people to use on... So everyone in the movie totally. thinks they're doing right, which makes it extra right. sad. But when, when she told that lie, I was... Oh, my God. Because then we find out like she wrote this horrible note to his girlfriend to bust him up. It's just... Yep. It's, it's so excruciating. Right, because the betrayal is one thing. It's because we know his mom sucks and that he hates his mom, but you know, he <laughs> yeah. was somewhat na- like he kind of has Stockholm syndrome. Period. Just like you know, oh, I was just trapped in her house for you know my teenage right. all of my years until I was a teenager, and you know, yeah, I'm just I can't I can't quit her even though I fucking despise her. So she, right. but when she tells that lie, it's so pointless. And again, this is where the exposition right. nature of the movie really helps because every character is just telling us facts. She tells it to us like it's true, and we just know it's fucking not. And we know it's, right. oh, man. But that scene ripped my heart out. It's oh, brutal. She's, but it's, she's perfect. It's just, she's amazing. She's so wonderful. And it does again, make you wonder where cast. were the other roles after this? Like, I know she worked a lot. But you're like, how was she not starring in everything after this movie? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, yeah. I mean, like, what was the trajectory? Well, how did like, she not you know become I mean? the Kathy Bates of those movies? You know what I mean? It kind of right. has that well, quality mean, of a performance to me. Just a little more sophisticated. Yeah. I mean, that's what it is, though. She is. She she might be one of my all-time favorite movie villains. Oh, man. Like, she truly has. She truly captures something unique about what it is to lie to yourself, but then the willingness you have to lie to your child is there's something quite wicked about that. It's pretty well, such a piece of shit that I even wondered if she gave the girl the queen of hearts costume. Oh, like, that's I wondered if she set that up. Cause she kept doing that. Hey, wait, wait, she'll be here. Wait, wait, she'll be here. And I was like, Oh fuck. She's going to use her as the trigger so that he thinks you know, he's cool. He's going to get back in close so he can walk into that guy's house unquestioned that's and kill him, right? Because that's how I was like, yeah, what yeah. Are the ch- this is the thing. She's so good. You're like, I don't believe she didn't know her son was, you know, the fucking target. 
I also don't believe right. that she invited this girl to her party, didn't know she snuck in the fucking back door, didn't notice she was wearing a queen of hearts or diamonds costume. The one fucking thing. That's As he's playing, sol- the timing of it, and, you, and again, that could just be you know how they're telling the story. I think that is but an see, absolute setup. I mean, I, I wouldn't disagree. I mean, that's like the how magic else of this he movie. So is... easily get into their house at the end to commit his assassination. Right. I mean, that's the magic of this movie at large is that it makes you look at every single thing that happens in this movie. Like, was that a setup? Is that a setup? Is this a put on? Like that yeah, kind of everything thing. Everything feels like a that's, put on. That, <laughs> she knew because that's what that I love great, about this movie. That great man. moment where Senator Thomas is like. Everyone thinks that uh, Island's a drunken fool. And he kind of looks at her side eye and he's like, I know he's not. And what he's saying yeah. is, I know you're not. And she fucking, yep. you know, he's like, I'll, I would take every dime I've ever had and could borrow and everything to stop you. And she's like, you motherfucker. Yeah. But she had to know. She had to know that. Because he, he knows. This is the one it's... thing, though, right? There are always these little wrinkles where it could go wrong. The one moment. And this gets back to Sinatra being the dumbest operative in movie history. <laughs> it's when Shaw's like, look at me. I told a joke. And I remember specifically oh, yeah. writing on my phone, did I miss the joke? Right? Like, I had no idea what the joke was. But he kept saying he did a joke and how much that meant. And he's like, hey, man, I came to question this dude because he's an assassin. And I know he's an assassin. And then she's like, but I got to get that honeymoon dick. And Sinatra goes, dope, I'll see you Monday. <laughs> and I was like, what? He's like, maybe you can fuck the wiring loose. That was Sinatra's plan. <laughs> and his superiors, like, I, this would be the best add-on to this movie ever, right? If they release, like, an art, you know, making of the movie companion. <laughs> they should hire yeah. someone to write Sinatra's, uh, you know, memos <laughs> on all of his planning. <laughs> It's like, I got a deck of cards, and I'm going to let his girlfriend fuck his brains out. Maybe that'll work. <laughs> like, I want to I wanna read Sinatra's plan, because literally, he shows up in his things. He tells his way-too-fast wife, who might also be working him, right? He might also be a plant, and that's why he does everything stupid. Right. He literally is like, today's the day where I get all the answers, and the nightmare stops, and I save America. And then just because some girl he's never met and some guy he hates, hates, but he's had like two heart to hearts with. And she's like, we gots to fuck. And he just goes, cool. Hands off. You're yeah, right. Well, Sorry then they have that. the great where Sinatra walks in. It's one of those like funny things when you use a prop poorly in a movie. <laughs> he walks in with the paper like no one holds a paper like sideways right to camera. <laughs> but he walks in and she's like, what's wrong? And he's like. I know the assassin Shaw killed his wife and his father-in-law, but in a way I did. And I go, there's no in a way about it. You definitely killed them. You had him. Definitely did it. You fucking had him. You had that. You could have been throwing queen of fucking diamonds all over that apartment, making it rain on it like it's $1 Thursdays. You know what I mean? And bring his ass back to the the pokey. Lock him up. (laughs) Movie over. I think Sinatra. maybe Sinatra's way too fast fiance was also working him. I mean, I always thought that Janet Lee is such a big like. Re- it's the same, you know. Also, those because she was the same thing in Psycho. She's like, the ultimate is red doing a Psycho actress, here. Yeah. <laughs> She's like the red herring actress. Look at me! Look at me! Psych. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. It's what? What's your final? Wrap this up. Wax poetic on this movie I mean, for a minute. Why do you love this movie so much? For me, The Manchurian Candidate exemplifies a lot of things I love about movies. Great technique, great acting, great performances. But the thing that it does better than anything is it it makes you walk the tightrope. Even though you know the information. Mm-hmm. You know what's going to happen. You know what's on the other side over there you're still going to walk the tightrope because 
it's just that good. You want to know how do I, how I might already know, but how are these guys going to find out? The fact that I care how they find out and I'm willing to suffer through like the world's worst karate class. <laughs> that is the, to be fair, the movie could have used more karate. <laughs> that is the strength of the Manchurian candidate is that I want to walk. I want to walk and I want to watch the things unfold, even though I already know yeah. it happened. I think that that's a great again. Yeah, I kind of thought of it as this slow moving train. I see the train. I know I can get off, uh, but it's still very tense and thrilling. And to me, I come back to we know all the details and information. Right? It's like reading a military briefing, right? Like, here's all these facts, yeah. right? Nothing's hidden. Absolutely. Everything's right on Front Street. But there are two or three moments of emotional truth that really mm -hmm. just come in out of nowhere and shock you. I, I actually totally. had a, <gasps> like I gasped audibly, you know, like you, you think people don't do that when they watch movies, you know, on their couch and their underwear. No. <laughs> but I did. Right. When he shot the Senator, I was like, right on. Like I knew that was coming. Right. Of course he said he's going to block, right. you know, the old uh, Viper over there. So she's going to take his ass out. <sighs> When his wife right. came down the stairs and saw him put a bullet in her dad, and he just quick draws her ass and shoots his own wife, I was rocked. Like, audibly shot up. and was like, no, no. You know, like, gasping like some old man, you know. I was like, what the fuck? Like, that rocked me. And even at the end, when he had his, when he turns around after his, uh, you know, sniper feed of taking out, uh, drunk stepdad and mom when yeah. he turns around it's not so much that he says I was the only one that could stop them this and that because he's not stopping anything all this shit's gonna keep going as Sinatra makes very clear when he reads like the the medal of honor descriptions and now that we know that Shaw's yeah. was false do we believe all of them you know and even like giving medals out for these horrific things we're hearing about is, wouldn't it just be better if that guy didn't go through it it's this whole like emotional idea right but him turning around and wearing the medal, right? The medal that's supposed to symbolize this great feat and him just putting it on, you know, him who represents essentially nothing but, you know, just an empty husk full of other people's lies. Like, those kind yeah. of moments just explode off the screen, right? And this this slow-moving thriller. I, I, I mean, I found it utterly fascinating. I think it still is just is impactful in today's society, you know, when we're not as afraid. I mean, there are still people that are wildly afraid of communism. But to me, it's just yes. these these weird group hypnosises we willingly jump in all the time. It's true. I mean, this is that's what the movie is. It's what makes the movie thrilling is the thought of the the thought of loss of individuality yeah. is more terrifying than but anything. But then the most individual and the the one who wants to rule the world is the worst person. So that's what I mean. The movie is just, I, and I think that's what's cool is it's always, you know, do you ever believe anything, right? Like if you're so afraid of groupthink and being brainwashed, do you go too far, you know? So I don't know. I, I think it's cool that the movie just plays in these, these just really fun gray areas, man. Agreed. A fascinating pick. I'm glad I finally got to mark that one off my list, man. It was awesome. Yeah. Me too, man. It was really an exceptional movie. That's it for the Manchurian Candidate. But the pod is still captive. Help. Help. All right. Up next, we got two more captivity joints for y'all. Uh, we got Compliance, which is an amazing little indie film about, based on a true story that is so ridiculous and horrifying, but is going to feel really real. Really real. Look, at that's the kind of brilliant wordsmithing. <laughs> That you get from this part. It's really real. <laughs> <laughs> and Black Snake Moan, which I am fucking pumped to talk about. Uh, also, guys, we have some more stuff coming your way, so stay tuned for that. Please leave us a rating and review wherever you find us, uh, especially on Apple Podcast app. Please find us on all your socials, especially uh, Twitter, at PhilMalchemist1. You can reach out to us, tell us movies you would like to hear us talk about, double features, entire month-long themes, uh, guest host that you'd like to hear us talk with, whatever you guys want, we want to hear it. Please hit us up. Film alchemist pod at gmail.com. That's right, baby. Uh, and you can see our pretty Manchurian faces 
on YouTube, where the Manchurian podcast is on YouTube. Uh, that's Nerd Alchemist, plural, with an S at the end. You can come see our brainwashed husk of bodies. Uh, that's it, guys. We'll be seeing you next week for the film Alchemist. I'm Josh Griffey. I'm Alex Dandino. <laughs>